We're going to break down all the factors and why Florence has become a thriving city. This way you can understand what makes a city grow as a real estate investor. This is a series where we break down how cities have grown over time, tell the stories, look at the data points, and show what actually helped their growth over time to make them become these big cities or centers of the world at the time. This way you as a beginner real estate investor can start to understand what makes a city a great place to invest in. Here's the structure of the episode. We'll first talk about the story and history of Florence, then we'll go through each factor that caused the city to grow all the way from their physical location, the culture, the politics, the economy, and the population. Then we'll talk about how you can actually use this information to pick a city that is actually going to be good for you to invest in. So let's take it back to 59 BC. Florence was a baby city founded by Julius Caesar and the Romans. He named it Florentia, which means the flourishing one. It was first used as a settlement of his soldiers because of the location of Florentia compared to Rome and the other areas in the Roman Empire. It was right in the middle of a trade route, had mountains around it, and had access to the river Arm Arno, which also connected to the Mediterranean Sea. And that helped it set up for such a killer future. But here's the deal. Rome didn't last forever. As that mighty empire crumbled, Florence got tossed around like a hot potato. It faced dark days when it was first invaded by the Ostrogoths in the siege of 405, then the Lombards in the 6th century. But Florence was a survivor. And by the 10th century, it started becoming a place for business activity to happen. And here's where things get juicy. In the 12th century, Florence turned into what is known as a commune. That is a self-governing city-state. A commune is a form of government where the power is shared by the community. They typically have a charter that give people rights and responsibilities for those who live there, similar to our Bill of Rights in the United States. These tend to be more democratic in nature. The only problem, like all governments for the most part, is that the power starts to get held by a few rich or a few powerful families. And in this case, it was split between a few different factions and a few different families that were very famous. Imagine Game of Thrones, like medieval Italy. That was it. Just an interesting side point. No matter how smart we get as a society, even thousands of years later, it seems like that we always have a government in which a few people are controlling the whole thing. Anyways, back to Florentia. By the 13th century, the commune wasn't enough, so Florence switched to Republic, which from my understanding is like a commune, but it's more like official with representatives and people elect those representatives and those representatives make a decision similar to like our Senate and the House in the US. They had a council known as the Signoria of Florence. These people were elected every two months, which might be something we want to learn here in the U.S. too. And yeah, just like any form of government, the wealthier residents ended up taking these positions, things like bankers and merchants and the members of the guilds. And at the heart of it all was this banking family known as the Medici. You could think of them as the Rockefellers of the Renaissance. They turned banking into an art and made it rain Florence all over Europe. Florence was Florence's currencies. They did more than just make a crap ton of money and transform banking. They sponsored artists, writers, scientists, and creators. People like Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Botticelli, Donatello, Raphael, Galileo, Dante Alighieri, Machiavelli. These people were all paid in some way, shape, or form by the Medici in order to explore their craft and make amazing things for us. And that caused Florence to become the center of a huge period in time known as the Renaissance. This was a time for huge change in learning, creativity, science, art, and politics. And Florence was the center of it all. This period lasted from somewhere between the 14th century to late 16th century. And once it started dying out, Florence also struggled a bit because of it. There were power struggles with different people controlling the area, economic downturns, and a shift from the economic center being Italy to Northern Europe. Florence eventually lost its independence and became part of the Grand Duchy of Tuscany, and then eventually became part of the kingdom in Italy, what it is today. But you know, Florence didn't disappear from the map. The city might have lost some of its political and and cultural clout, but it's never lost its soul. It's remained a beacon of art culture and creativity for artists around the world. Now that you got a quick overview of Florence's history, let's break down exactly what factors caused it to grow so you could start to make a picture of why the city exploded. The first area I want to look at is its physical location and the geography around the city. And of course, we can't talk about that without hitting on the Arno River. The Arno River originates from the Mediterranean Sea and goes straight through Florence. And eventually it ends east of Florence. This made transporting goods and services from the west side of Europe all the way through to Florence. And at that point in time, it was a lot easier to travel by sea than it was by land because there were no cars and no airplanes at that point in time. Not only that, but the fish of the river provided as a good resource for people to be able to eat all while they created their wonderful art and shaped the world during the Renaissance. So having access to a body of water like this allowed for resources to easily flow in and out of the city and throughout the city, as well as transportation to getting to where you need to go to making trades or speaking to other people in influential positions like what the Medici did. The second part about its physical 
physical location is the road known as Via Francigena. I speak Italian, but I don't know if I pronounce that right. So again, back in the day, we didn't have amazing roads that took us everywhere. One of the huge things that the Romans brought to the world were creating roads that are actually paved so people could transport things a lot easier and a lot quicker across long distances. That's why they were able to conquer the world and create such a large empire. One of these roads is known as Via Francigena, and it starts all the way at the bottom of the boot of Italy, cuts through Rome, cuts through Florence, and ends up as far as Canterbury in England. This obviously helped with Florence's trade because they had an easy way of transporting things other than just the river and the sea. Influential people would have to come through Florence if they were traveling through this road. Goods and services. This probably helped their population growth because it was easy to get to Florence, and once they were there, maybe they liked it and they stayed. Even in the U.S. today, places that have solid built-out roads have way more traffic because it's easier to get to. So having built-out roads helps your city grow and adds population and brings business to it. If you look at a map of the U.S. and you look at any major city, you'll see all these roads coming out of the city because people know that they need access to get to the city. And so this helped Florence grow a lot. Third thing about their location is the surrounding hills around Florence. Florence is a city between several hills. You got the Fiesole, the Settigiano, the Arcetri, Poggio Imperiale, and Bello Sguardo. Again, I don't know if I pronounce any of those right, but these are hills right around Florence. And back in the day, because war was mainly fought by foot, traveling over a hill made an area more protected because people would have to go over the hill in order to get there. And the hills acted as physical barriers that were able to protect the city of Florence more than other cities would have if they had level ground. If those hills weren't there, it could have caused more people to try to siege Florence, which could have affected its population, could have maybe killed off some of the artists, which improved their history. It could have affected the economy there because if merchants died, then they weren't able to pass off their craft. So while this didn't really force people to move to Florence, having these hills instead protected Florence from losing people and losing business. The next part about its physical location is that it was surrounded by the Mediterranean Sea. On the left-hand side, to the west, you got the Mediterranean Sea, and to the right, you got the Mediterranean Sea. Florence is smack in the middle of the Italian peninsula. Now, being in the middle of the Italian peninsula, in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, made it in the middle of all these trades that were happening. Being the middleman forced people to have to come through Florence, forced influential people, forced businesses, forced trade to have to come through Florence, which helped Florence's economy. But also, if you're the middleman in some of these trades, that means you get to have more power and influence as a city because if you're the person who runs a city like the Medici, you can use that as leverage to talk to other countries and nations and city states and say, hey, you want to pass through my area? You got to bank with me, which then helps your economy, which then helps more people come, which then helps everything about the area. So having access to water is good for travel and trade. The last part about the location that really helped Florence growth are the fertile lands and the climate of the area. Florence's economy was based off of the trade of wool, silk, wine, and olives. Florence was a great place for these things for a few reasons, and we'll dive into them more in the economy section, but let's talk about it a little bit here. It is a climate of warm, dry summers and wet, mild winters. That type of climate is great for growing olives and grapes. Obviously, grapes are used in wine, and olives are used for olives and olive oil. The reason why is those plants don't like to hold too much water, and the soil around those plants are great for drainage. But not only that, the climate and the soil were perfect for what is known as mulberry trees, and silkworms eat mulberry trees. Silkworms are used to create silk. The hills were great because they provided more sunlight and drainage for the soil, and the height helps them stay at cooler temperatures than they would if they were on the ground, and that helps grapes retain acidity, which helps the balance of wine. The Apennine Mountains nearby were where sheep were raised, and the climate was perfect for the sheep to have quality fleece, which are the materials used in clothing, and the hills actually provided a great way for the sheep to graze, which helped them maintain their health and wool quality. That's enough about location. Let's talk about the economic factors that helped Florence become what it was. First up again is wool. Just like we said, due to the climate and the location near the hills in Florence, it became the center of wool production. The main type of sheep in this area that they used were known as the merino. Those are known for higher wool quality. Not only this, but Florence had these series of guilds, which are basically groups of people in an art field that set standards for the quality of different products. So they had one for wool known as the Arte de Lana. And this guild forced the quality of wool to come up with higher standards on top of the fact that it came from such a good area. The second part of Florence's economy was silk. Florence's silk came from the silkworms, which came to this area because they're mulberry trees. The silk industry also had its own guild in Florence, which maintained high quality standards known as the Arte della Seta. And at the time, it was real bougie for powerful families to have silk in their clothing because it showed that they were wealthy and prestigious. So more and more people wanted silk, which drove up demand and caused Florence to make more money. It's like wearing Gucci or Prada today. But the difference is, is that the materials are actually better because of the quality of the silk that they were using. Similar to wool, there were also tons of people 
that were skilled in their craft and there were workshops and tons of people coming to learn about how to make silk and how to make wool, which caused more people to come there if they wanted to be part of that industry. Next were olives and olive oil. Olives were a huge part of Florence's exports and trades. Again, due to the climate and the soil, it became great for olives. They also had their own guild known as the Arti degli Oilendoli e Pezzicagnoli. Again. Who knows if I pronounce that right? These were the guilds for olives and they helped maintain the standards as well. And because the olives and the olive oil from this region were high quality, having olives and olive oil from this region was known as another sign of like wealth and prestige because if you were using the finest olive oil from Florence, guess what? You were bougie, which drove up the demand. Next up is wine. Florence's wines come from Chianti Mountains and its favorable climate. It actually allowed for a lot of different types of wines to be created, like white wines and red wines of different flavors. Some areas in the world were only able to produce red or white because of their climate, but because of Florence's climate and soil, they were able to create multiple types and multiple blends. There was another guild for this known as the Arti di Navinettieri. Not only that, but they came up with a few innovations of wine, like wine blending, which would help create more complex and balanced flavors and they focused more on how the vines were pruned and trained next up and arguably most famously was art we'll talk about this a lot more but basically the rich people of florence used their money to sponsor artists and these pieces of art were able to be sold for a lot more than they spent on it because it was such a rare commodity which if they did sell it they were able to make more money which brought more money to florence not only that but this drove population growth because artists from all over wanted to come to florence to learn from the great people like leonardo da vinci or michelangelo or botticelli the art also had a subtle effect of Florence's economy. It made Florence seem great and powerful because they had all these statues and stuff. At the time, paintings and statues would be ways of like showing off. Look at me, I have a huge statue built after me. Think of it as like a way of getting media coverage because there was no media at that point. People would think you're an important person and they should make deals or do business with you, which helped the economy as well. Next is marble. A lot of the world's marble come from a farther part of the region Tuscany, which is where Florence is in, known as Carrara. This marble was used by art artists like Michelangelo to make all of his statues and buildings. The marble from this area is known for its purity and durability. A lot of marble today is still used from Carrara. Now, this wasn't something that Florence directly sold, but its proximity to the marble is what made part of the art and the buildings and the beautifulness of Florence flourish because if it was further away, it might have been harder for Florence to actually get these statues and pay these artists to build these beautiful things, which without those things would have affected the city's economy. Lastly, as part of the economy, banking was huge in Florence. The Medici family is the biggest name behind all of this, and they made Florence a huge banking center. But why the Medici family? What did they do? They popularized double bookkeeping, which is actually something they use today, apparently, which is when you record each transaction twice, once as a debit and once as a credit, which allows for accurate and transparent bookkeeping. Accuracy and transparency leads for more trust and then more business. If you had the option between banking between a bank that was very transparent about what they did and a bank that wasn't, I would choose a transparent bank, which helps them get business. They also came up with what was known as bills of exchange, which was like the father of the modern check that you use to give people money. At the time, religions, specifically the Catholic Church, was against charging interest on loans, which is known as usury. The Medici came up with this thing called bills of exchange in order to get around it. It was basically a written order that said, you owe money to this person on this date. This was a way that they were able to sneak interest into checks because it was like, up front, you owe X amount of dollars more. But it also allowed people to travel more safely because if they were traveling with the bills of exchange versus cash, if they had cash, they would have got it stolen from them. But with the bills of exchange, they were safe because there was nothing they could steal. And besides the Medici, Florence had a currency known as the Florin, which was backed by gold. This made this currency more valuable than some of the other ones at the time because gold was a limited resource. Again, maybe the US should learn from this and put the dollar on a gold standard. This way we could stop screwing everyone with inflation. But, you know, who am I to say? But because of their banking innovations and the currency and the relationships that they had, it helped more and more people bank with Florence banks, which brought more money to Florence, which then allowed them to invest in art, science, and different things, which allowed more people to come to Florence, helping the guilds, helping their government, ultimately this huge cascading effect. I want to talk about a cross factor here, which was the location's effect on the economy, because we talked about this already, but I want you to be aware of the trade routes, the Arno and the Via Francigena allowed for access to resources and transportation 
education, which helped its economy. And then we have jewelry. Florence was one of the main jewelers in Europe at this time. The jewelers there were specifically skilled in a few different things, enameling, filigree, and the art of setting precious stones. There was a small amount of gold in the Arno River that helped them with this, but it wasn't because they had access to tons of gold there. It was morely because they had skilled labor there. All right, that's enough about Florence's economy. Let's focus a little bit more on their population and what factors went into that. Again, I'm going to harp on this a bunch, but its location was so important to this. The access to the roads, the bodies of water, and its protection around the hills helped the population be maintained and grow. And not only that, because it was already part of the Roman Empire to start, obviously it was seeded with some people to start off with, which is hard when you're starting a new city anywhere. If it has money and people to start with, then typically the city will grow. And the Romans definitely helped there. The second part about its population was its peace. Florence had a decent amount of peace. It wasn't without wars, but when an area doesn't go to war that often, people get to stay alive. And those people can focus on growing the city rather than just focus on protecting the city. And a lot of these relationships were because of the Medici family. But peace equals population growth. Now, one thing that hurt Florence a lot was the plagues that happened throughout time. A lot of cities in these areas were affected by plagues, but let's give a little breakdown of the history of the population. In 59 BC, Let's say it was founded by a few thousand people. And by 1300, it was closer to 100,000 people. So significant growth. But in 1348, the Black Death arrived, which decreased its population in half to 50,000. And by 1450, with a few other plagues, its population dropped to 40,000. Now the population stayed around 50,000 until 1550 because of plagues between 1456 and 1463, 1478 and 79, 1522 and 1527. But then around 16 century, Century, the population was around 70,000. So imagine if those plagues weren't there, how much Florence would have actually grown. And then the Italian plague that happened in the 1650, the population was 75,000. So the population still grew, albeit slowly throughout this time, because people wanted to be there. But the problem was that there were all these plagues killing off people around the same time. Now, obviously, we don't see as much of this anymore because of medical advancements and, you know, we're kind of smarter now. But knowing that plagues, and another word that starts with P that I don't want to say because I don't want to get demonetized. <laughs> Those things affect your investment strategy because they could affect populations. The next major factor was the government in Florence or at the time. First thing I want to talk about how Florence had a republic versus a lot of the oligarchies. A republic again is one with elected representatives that represent the people. Those people were elected every two months and it was corrupted because a lot of people who were very powerful were the only people that were allowed to hold positions, which seemed to happen with the Medici a lot. But on paper, it's more fair for the average person than it is to be part of an oligarchy or a monarchy because they actually held elections. And at the time, there were only a few other republics. So if you were an average person, I would have picked up and moved from the monarchy or the oligarchy to come to a republic because you actually had more of a say and more potential advancement higher. We're seeing this in the US after the events of 2020, regardless of how you feel about it. Texas and Florida were more open and more free. And because of those governments, more and more people from California, New York, New Jersey, and those areas all fled to Texas and Florida. Florida. Those areas saw population growth and the other areas saw population decline. And if that triggers you, just wake up and look at the data. But a favorable government more towards the people and freedom allows for more population growth over time. It's also why people left communist countries to come to America. So the structure of the government does affect whether people want to move to an area or move away because the government can incentivize people to leave or stay based on high taxes and policies. The second factor of how the government helped Florence was that it was a huge supporter of the arts. The government was typically made up of these wealthy men who use a lot of their money to support artists so they can do art. We mentioned this already, but it can show the power effect that the government has. If the government reinvests in their local economy by supporting the artists who live in the area, it can bring more people that are interested in art to the area, which will then help increase their economy. So in this case, the government helped flourish the artist community. Now, another part of Florence's Republic were these guilds. The guilds held standards for different crafts. We talked about this already, but things like silk, wool, olives, wine, butchers, blacksmiths, doctors, and bankers all had their own guilds. They maintained standards of really high quality. High quality usually leads to more demand. And so these people were typically innovators and people that were top of their field because they were the ones setting the standards for everything, which would usually bring more people to the city. The only con with having these guilds is that if you force too high of standards on people, then it doesn't really allow for a lot of innovation. So it's kind of a mixed bag. But given the history, I think we could say that the guilds helped Florence. Now these next 
next two factors were hard to find sources on, but these are my understandings of them. First up were citizenship laws. Florence apparently had rules that made it easier for people to become a citizen-like person of Florence. You could become a citizen by marrying someone who is from Florence, owning property, or joining one of the guilds. And to join one of the guilds, you had to be skilled in a craft and be able to afford the fees that come along with the guild. Now, this meant that if you had a skill and you worked hard, you could potentially join a guild, which could get you citizenship in Florence. You can compare this to other republics at the time, like Venice, where they had just a golden book that if you were a noble family from Venice, you were part of this golden book. And those people were able to hold specific offices and have the power. Or in England, where you need to be an owner of land in order to have any say. And so while it wasn't perfect, and it wasn't as good as we have it today, it was still better for the time. And the last thing were land ownership laws. Again, I'm a little unclear on the data that I found, but this is what I was able to piece together. That you were able to own property in Florence, even if you were not noble, and you didn't have to be granted it like from a lord, like you would have if you were in other places of Europe at the time. Now, if you wanted to own property and where you lived, you had to be granted it, it would be better for you to live in Florence because you have the option to buy property, even if you're not from one of these wealthy families. So that could have helped population growth because people want to be in an area where it's easy for them to become a citizen and have a say and be able to buy property, which helps their wealth and their family long term. The next area of factors I want to dive into are influential people that affected Florence's growth. And obviously, we're going to start with the Medici. We talked about this a little bit, but beyond coming up with the bills of exchange and popularizing double entry bookkeeping, Medici did so much to help prop up Florence. I mean, at points in time in their government, they were basically the rulers, even though they had a republic. They would use their wealth, their power, their influence to make relationships with people in order to get the things that they wanted done, done. But how did they get to that point? It started by lending money out to sovereign individuals like the Pope or kings, which normally in the past, this used to be a risky thing and not something that bankers would do. But the Medici got rich by doing this because they lent money to these very powerful people. And then those powerful people lent them armies, lent them their word, and helped them navigate other relationships that they wouldn't have been able to do without them. They had relationships with the Pope, Venice, Spain, Milan, Naples, and France, and obviously the artists. They also were able to set up branches around a lot of these major cities due to their relationships, which made their banking more easily to be done in a lot of other areas, which means more money, which means more wealth and more connections. The Medici also cared so much about art, specifically sponsoring Botticelli, Leonardo da Vinci, and Michelangelo. As a Takeaway, if you're looking to invest in the area and there's a very powerful family who cares a lot about that area and they're willing to invest heavily in the local economy, that's going to be good for you in the long run. Now I want to cover some of these artists and writers who were super influential at the time, first starting with Donatello. He lived from 1386 to 1466. He was a master of sculpting, specifically bronze. And he was really known for basically being able to show emotional states in his art. He later influenced Michelangelo's work in sculpture. He actually created his own version of the statue of David, which is not as popular as Michelangelo. Angelo statue of David. And that was the first male nude sculptor at the time because the church didn't want them. But this goes to show that one artist can bring another artist, which can bring more people, which can bring more statues. Imagine how many people wanted to come just to learn from Donatello and all these other ones we're about to talk about. Second person is Filippo Brunelleschi. He lived from 1377 to 1446. And he was known for his architecture and engineering. He made the designs for the Florence Cathedral, which is known as the Duomo. And that took over 150 years to make. It was super innovative at the time to make a dome that was self-supporting like that using flying buttresses. He also came up with linear perspective in art, which made the depth look more realistic and make things have like a 3D look on a flat surface. Then you got Leonardo da Vinci. He lived from 1452 to 1519. And he was literally probably the most famous person in this entire period. He made the Mona Lisa, the Last Supper, and the Vitruvian Man. He, along with Michelangelo, literally dissected dead people just to understand what the anatomy would be like of these people. Now, Michelangelo used that for sculpting people's bodies, but Leonardo used it to make advancements in anatomy. He was also an inventor who came up with early forms of the helicopter and a parachute. You got Michelangelo Buonarroti. He was an Italian sculptor and painter who lived from 1475 to 1564. He made the famous Pietà and the statue David, the more famous one. He was an amazing sculptor mainly because, again, he tore apart bodies in the middle of the night just to understand what it would be like to move this arm so he could build a sculpture showing real 
depth of the human body. He also painted the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican. He lived and was sponsored to be with the Medici family. You got Raphael, who was a painter and the head architect at the Sistine Chapel. He ran classes and had tons of apprentices. Was also a ninja turtle. Botticelli, he was a painter who was also sponsored by the Medici, who made the birth of Venus in the Primavera. Dante Alighieri, the poet who wrote the Vine Comedy, and then basically was the guy that founded the Italian language by making it normal, which was actually Tuscany's dialect at the time. Petrarch, he was known as the father of humanism, which had a huge revival in this period, was a huge writer at the time, and influenced almost all of the poetry. Boccaccio, he wrote the Decameron, which was a collection of stories from people who fled Florence from the Black Death, and he helped stabilize the Italian language. Amerigo Vespucci, this is literally the guy that the Americas are named after. He was a great cartographer to make maps, and he was the first person to give maps of the Americas. Galileo Galilei, now he was originally from Pisa, but moved to Florence, and he's basically the guy that argued that the sun was the center of the universe instead of the earth, which was a huge thing at this time. He made improvements to telescopes, and he laid the groundwork for Newton's laws of physics. Machiavelli is the guy who wrote The Prince, which was a dark book about using manipulation in politics and power. Kind of talks about like what the Medici might have done. But all of these influential people came and lived in Florence, which brought more influential people and people that wanted to learn from them, which helped its economy, which helped its status, which helped it be a center of the world at the time. So without people, it's gonna be hard to build a city that you wanna build. Next up is culture. First, let's talk about the culture of politics. The idea that Florence was a republic was different and innovative at the time. It allowed for elections and people to be subbed in and out. And those people who were elected could be accountable by the people. This helped with the flow of ideas because people were more open to talk about things because they weren't shut down like in a monarchy or in a socialist or communist government. And this brought more open thinkers in the area, which helped people who were interested in leveling up. Art, science, and education is another factor. Because of the massive amounts of money going to sponsor these artists, creators, and writers, a lot of effort was put into creativity, ideas, and education. Leonardo pushed through discoveries in anatomy, Galileo in math and physics, Brunelleschi in engineering, Michelangelo in sculpting, Dante in Machiavelli in writing. This is like how Hollywood became a hub for actors because so many movies started to be made there. If you wanted to be in those fields, you started moving to Hollywood. My cousin literally moved from New York to Hollywood because of that exact reason, which when more people move to that area, it helps the future of that specific economy grow even more, helping people believe that this is the hub for these things. So Florence became the hub of art, improving the economy and bringing more and more people to it. Now, what can you take away from this whole thing that will help you as a real estate investor to understand the growth of Florence and use that to help you understand the growth? of other cities in the future. First, I want to point out that just like any other city, a lot of these factors start working together and blending together. And it's kind of like a cascading effect. Once one starts kicking in, it makes the city better. If it's making the city better, more people want to come to it, which makes that better. And so all these factors compound upon themselves. First, let's talk about the people. The people are what drove the innovation, the ideation, and the growth, the economy. They set the culture of what it was like to come to Florence and live in Florence. The artists, the writers, the architects, the bankers, all help by improving the economy Economy, bringing people, boosting business, which in the future drove more innovation and business forward, kind of like a domino effect. So if you're going to invest in an area, it's important for you to start paying attention to if there are people that are trying to invest in the area where innovations come out of. Because as one innovation comes out of an area, it leads to more people wanting to be there. And those people that want to be there end up bringing more people that want to be there and more business that want to be there. Second thing is the government. It's important that the government actually supports expansion and growth. Even though compared to now, living in Florence is probably worse than today. The way of property ownership, becoming a citizen, the Republican form of government, and supporting the arts all led to this growth within the city. So make sure that the policies, the politicians, all are moving forward and helping growth and expansion in the area. So you want to look for areas that are more landlord friendly because they help growth. You want to look at the building laws. Areas that have worse building laws are going to hurt supply over time. You want an area with low taxes because low taxes means more growth. The third thing is the location. Back then, and even now to some extent, picking an area with natural resources could actually really help the economy. Because as long as you know that those resources are in demand, you will have a stable economy. It's like why everyone wants Taiwan, because that's where most of the chips are created. And chips are really important right now because of AI. And that will drive the future of where we're at. Not only that, but the climate of an area is usually a big draw. Because if the climate's decent, people are going to want to move there and it might support different resources to be created, like it was for Florence with the olives and the wines and the sheep and the silkworms. But what we're seeing right now is people are moving south to escape 
escape the cold. Not only that, but also having access to different forms of transportation, like by road with the Via Francigena, the Arno, the Mediterranean Sea, it made it easy for people to come to and away from Florence. So an area that has more transportation options because of its location really helps the growth of an area. So areas that have airports, areas that have a lot of roads, and then within the city, areas that have biking and scooters and cars, those things make it easier for people to transport. So the infrastructure matters. And then fourth is having a diversified economy. Florence was able to have so much power over this time because they controlled a lot of things. Wool, silk, olives, wine, jewelry, art, all these things were super influential at the time. And banking too. How did I forget that? So if something happened to one of those fields, it didn't really matter because they had a lot of other jobs, a lot of other opportunities. And so it would prevent the city from going into an economic downturn. An example of this, and we might make a future episode on this in the future, is Detroit. Detroit was heavily focused on the motor industry. And as the motor industry left the United States, it ended up hurting that area. Now, median home prices in Detroit are still like $40,000, which is probably what it was 70 years ago. So picking one city that is not too dependent on one industry can really help because if one goes down, at least you know that you won't lose everything. Overall, it's hard to say which things came first, but clearly it was a combination of all these things, like the resources that were naturally there, its location, the investment from the Romans in the beginning, and the investments of the Medici in the art and the banking industries, which caused more people to be there. And then the transportation options were easy for people to come. At the end of the day, what people want in a place to live are going to be the same, whether it's the 1300s or 5th BC or whatever it is. They want a place to live in that's cool, that's growing, that has people there, that's not heavy in crime, and allows them to live freely. If you're new here, please hit the subscribe button for more breakdowns like this.